how do we center ourselves when things are going astray? I mean, that is the billion dollar question, right? Um, it's really hard to quantify. You know, I think that a lot of it starts with how the club feels in your head. All right, welcome to episode six of the Player Pursuit Podcast. We have a very special guest today, the short game chef on Instagram, social media, Parker McLaughlin. It's great to have you on, Parker. Hey, glad to be with you. All right, for those who don't know, Parker is a former PGA Tour player, PGA Tour winner turned short game coach, kind of teaches a number of high-level tour players that we will definitely get into. But I always like to kind of start with your background as a player, Parker. Um, you know, where'd you grow up? Yeah, so born and raised in Hawaii. Um, golf was kind of my, like, third, like, favorite sport. Um, you know, my, my first true loves were I was kind of a gym rat, so basketball and volleyball were my first two loves. Uh, my dad was a high school basketball coach and a high school volleyball coach. So I was I was really always in the gym, shagging balls, you know, just just a gym rat. And and then I was introduced to golf when I was, you know, probably around like eight. Um, but I really started to take it seriously around 12. Um, but I still played volleyball and basketball throughout high school as well as golf. And then uh, I went to UCLA and um, I played, you know, I went there on a, on a golf scholarship, but uh, the the volleyball coach at UCLA, this legendary coach, Al Skates, you know, he had known my dad for years. And, and so I had reached out to him and said, Hey coach, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, potentially try out for your team as well. And he's like, he's like, yeah, come on. So when pra- I went and practiced uh, two practices with, with the team and I was like, Oh my gosh, these guys are so big. I'm like, I belong, I belong on the golf course. So uh, my, my, college volleyball career ended pretty quick that's amazing so i actually lived in maui uh the last three and a half years or so just got back uh to the mainland myself and we'll dive into all the you know maybe some of the stuff that happened at the pga show open forum the nerdy stuff later but i wanted to pick your brain a little bit about different sports growing up how do you think that impacts your development as a player especially a junior golfer uh, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of people playing a variety of sports. Um, you know, I've got a couple of young kids now, 10 and 13 years old, and I, my son loves every sport. Um, but you know, he's always getting asked to play. I'm like, hey, you got to play on this club team, or you got to be on this club team. And they want him to play year round. And I'm like, he's 10 years old. No. So every, every season, he plays a different sport. And so yeah. it's, it's just always kind of, I think it's just a good way to keep, to keep like soccer provides a whole set of footwork skills that's going to be necessary, plus conditioning skills. When he's playing flag football, it, it, that provides a different, you know, catching and throwing and all that stuff. So there's, there's all sorts of different, um, I don't know, like modalities that you need to learn as an athlete um, that will help you in whatever it is you decide to, to pursue. But for him, I'm like, you're playing all the different sports uh, until at some point, you know, 13, 14, 15, you make your decision and you say, that's where I'm going to go. And so if, if I ever work with a junior golfer, I'm like, you make sure you play another sport. So just focus only on golf. Yeah, I tell my clients the same thing. I, I recently went and watched one of my high-level juniors. He's 10. And I told him, get back home where it's cold and, and focus on basketball right now. Like, yeah, hit some balls into the net. You know, working on a putting that kind of thing, but they, those skills are invaluable. And there's something to be said about just being an athlete and how much that's going to help you later on. And we see it every every event now on tour. I mean, these guys are bigger, stronger, faster than ever before, and it's only going to benefit you, really. So, when you were coming up as a player, what kind of shaped your um, philosophy? Did you have an instructor that that kind of molded you, or, or did you just mess around and find it? Super minimal instruction uh, growing up. Um, I was introduced to the game by a guy named Greg Nichols, who was the head pro at Wildlife Country Club. And so mm-hmm. he would kind of give us just fun games to play. Um, he loved he loved the short game. And so that's sort of where my love of the short game uh, was, was sort of founded there. He was, a, he was like a, a fantastic putter, beautiful stroke, looked a lot like Brad Faxon. And, um, and that's sort of where, like, you know, my love of the short game started. 
but there wasn't a ton of instruction. It was a group lesson that I think I did like once a week for like probably five years, six years. Yeah. And that was sort of my, the only instruction I ever got. And uh, I was just, go, I was just going out there to figure it out. And it was like, you're behind a coconut tree. You got to figure out how to shape it left or right. And you would just, you would just sort of play and be creative. And that's, that's really where, um, that's really where like my creativity sort of blossomed. Mm -hmm. And it was like almost, I was almost more accurate when I had an obstacle in front of me than I was in the middle of the fairway. Yeah. Um, it kind of forces you into something when you have that challenge. Yep. And, and it just, it, it, it stimulated something for me creatively and in my brain to where I really got like fully locked in. Uh, you know, I would say like, you know, you look at someone like a Jordan speed, like I, my game was, my game was similar to that, where it was like, you get behind something and I'm going to pull something crazy out of my out of the path. You know? Um, like I, I, I would, I would do that not to his level, but that was sort of how my, how my game was sort of styled. Yeah. And, and so after college, uh, what was your journey to the tour? Like I imagine Q school, the whole the kind of standard pattern. Yeah, I played. I played uh, every mini tour that was available at the time. Uh, I played for two, about two, two and a half years. So Hooters tour, Gateway tour, Tight Lies tour, um, the Spanos tour. Uh, I played. I played all those. All those tours. Um, I actually won on all those tours in those like two and a half years. And went to Q school. I think on my third third time to Q school, I, I finally got through to the final stage. And, and that was, you know, it was like, you know, I'll remember it like, like it was yesterday because it was just like, it was just one of those moments where it was like, man, I just need a break. And I, I was, it was the final round, final day. And I, I was on the last hole and I had a mud ball and I had like, it was, it was cold. It was a cold, uh, cold and windy day in Houston. And I, and I had this mud ball in the very last hole and I had like 195 yards. And I hit this four iron and this this thing takes off and it hooks like this and it miss the green and then all of a sudden midair it shifts back and starts fading like a mud ball would do and this thing ends up like six inches from the hole okay and I tap in for birdie and I and I and I wait and I was like the first group off the front nine and so I was in like maybe 30 30th place 35th place and in, in top 18 or 17 you know qualify make, make it through and I waited all the way to the end, the final, the very final group, the, the leader group, they shoot like 77, 77, 78. And they, they all go from tied for the lead all the way back to my number where I was. So they let everybody in that was, that was tied for, we were maybe like tied for 20th or something like that. And then all of a sudden those three guys came back down. Now we're all tied for 17th. And it let all of us in to the final stage. And that was really like the sort of the break that I got um, to sort of really propel my career. You know, there's there's the few players every generation where, you know, they, they're they it's almost like they're destined to be one of the top players in the world. But every other tour player, it seems like has that story, that big break, that that thing that allowed them to get where they wanted to go, which, you know, it speaks to how special of a talent that all these guys have, but also how thin the margin of error is at every stage. You know, every year we hear of a guy who barely made it past first stage, who, you know, secures their card somehow. And it's like, everything's so close. It's crazy. Um, but yeah. I want to talk about. It's here. It's here. <laughs> so much of it that's right in between your ears that separates. Mm -hmm. Where does somebody feel pressure? It's like, well, is it first stage or is it second stage or is it final stage? Or can they not get over the hump to, you know, to win on the Corn Ferry Tour, or can they not get over the hump to win on the PGA Tour? There's so many like really talented guys that haven't really won on the PGA Tour yet, and you're like, well, you are so like once you start to believe in here, you're going to start to win a lot. So there's a yeah, th th there's always sort of that that unquantifiable mental component that it's like, well, why is that person so good and they're not they're not making right to one stage or the next or whatever it might be a lot of it is right here oh that's amazing to hear you talk about i want to before we talk about what you're doing now which is equally as impressive i want to talk about um you know your best season on tour 
um, get it, getting a win. Speaking of the mental side of it, what was that like coming down the stretch? Uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was my, it was my sixth week in a row of playing and, and I thought I was going to be done after Canada, which was the week before, but I had found something on like Sunday of Canada. It, I, all of a sudden I was like, Oh man, I'm starting to hit it exactly where I'm looking. Like the ball's coming out the right shape, everything. And I was like, Ooh, this feels pretty good. So I was entered to play Reno. And so I, I ended up saying, okay, I come back. I, I went from Canada back home to Scottsdale, hung out Monday, Tuesday. And then uh, I went and hit balls like late Tuesday afternoon. And I was like, Oh, I still got it. I still got that feeling. And no, I, I, I know where the ball is going. And it's just sort of those feelings that you have as a player where you're just like, I can't miss. Like, this is in the right slot. It's, so I was like, I got to play. So I told my wife on Tuesday night, I was like, I'm going to book a flight, flying up Wednesday morning. I'm, play, I'm scheduled to play the Pro-Am Wednesday afternoon, and I'm going to play. She's like, perfect. You go. We've been on the road for a, five weeks. I'm going to do some stuff here at home. Sounds good. So I go, and she's she, she basically told me on, like, when I got back, she's like, when you laugh, I knew you were going to win. And so, anyhow, fast forward, I, I, I shoot 68, 62 the first two days. And I've got like a, I don't know, maybe a three-shot lead or something like that. Two, three-shot lead. And then I shoot uh, 66 on Saturday. And now I've got like a seven-shot lead, six shot, a six-shot lead. But I was like, I was six shots over second place. I was nine shot lead over third place. I was an 11 shot lead over fourth place. That's and bliss so, in the field at that point. Yeah, there was like a huge, a huge gap. Um, and I just, everything was online. And I had a local caddy uh, who I had had caddy for me uh, at first stage of Q school when I went to Reno there. I, I'd done first stage of Q school there twice. And this guy had caddy for me there. But he also worked at Montro. And those greens are like notoriously difficult to read. And so this guy was reading these putts so perfectly. He knew my speed, everything. And so I was hitting it great. I was making a bunch of putts. And so now I've got a six-shot lead going into Sunday. But I, the, the, the last, like, couple of holes on Saturday felt a little a little wonky. Like, I, I didn't quite hit the center of the face. Felt a little heely, a little low on the heel. And I was like, oh, no, I, I know that feeling. And that is not a good feeling. That's not a good pattern for me. And so I, I was a little anxious, um, you know, going into Saturday night. And the previous year on the Corn Ferry Tour, I'd had my PGA Tour card, but I went down to play a Corn Ferry event. And I had a seven-shot lead in a Corn Ferry event with 18 holes to play. And I lost it in the first nine holes. I shot four over, and Jimmy Walker shot four under, and I lost, I lost the lead. So that's playing in my head as well Saturday night. And so I don't sleep hardly at all, uh, just tossing and turning. You know, it's like as strong as I was mentally, it was like well, I felt like I had no control over my over my thoughts and my brain. It just felt like all I kept seeing was what could possibly go wrong. And it was it, it, it wouldn't allow me to go to sleep. And I just kept seeing like these bad outcomes and bad shots and like, so um, I didn't sleep a wink. Um, I get up the next day. I think I had like a 1.30, 1.30 tea time. So I had all morning to now think about it even more and um, dealing with a little bit of anxiety of like, oh, I know my golf swing, it, it's sort of starting to leave me. And um, didn't hit a single shot on the range that felt flush or pure. Like could not find the center of the club face warming up. Went out on the front nine. I hit one out of nine greens in regulation and I was even par, right? So that's like sort of like the genesis of like where short game chef started was like, dude, I, I, I hit one green in regulation and got up and down eight out of eight times on Sunday with the lead. Oh my God. Uh, and so I end up, I end up playing the back nine, you know, like I said, thankfully there, there weren't too many guys that were that close to me. Um, but I, I hit five greens in regulation on Sunday. Uh, I shot two over par, and I actually stretched my lead from six and I ended up winning by seven. Um, but it was, an, it was a nerve-wracking, you know, I, I didn't really feel 
like like I could exhale at all until mm -hmm. I hit my second shot on 18 onto the green. And that happened to be the only birdie I made all day. It was like a 15 footer on 18 to win. And it was like, yeah, it just, just ne I was never able to like really enjoy the walk or like mm -hmm. be, I, it was just sort of like, I'm just fighting my golf swing, fighting the thoughts in my head. And it was just, it was just one of those days I was just trying to put one foot in front of the next and survive. Yeah, and that's going to be a really good time. We're actually going to take a quick break and stick around. We're going to have Short Game Chef back soon. All right. I, I, that's – what a week. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you even breathe through that? Um, <laughs> it's funny. It it's comes and goes so fast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think kind of talk about that for a sec. And then, yeah, yeah obviously get into kind of what you're doing now. Let's do it. All right. All right, welcome back to the show with Parker McLaughlin, the short game chef. And he just went over his, his PGA Tour win. And what we wanted to talk about next is sort of how the game comes and goes. I mean, is it the chicken or the egg? Do we, do we feel good because we're playing good? Or do we play good because we feel good? And how, how do we center ourselves when things are going astray? I mean, that is the billion dollar question. Right. Um, it's really hard to quantify. You know, I think that a lot of it starts with how the club feels in your hand, how you're making your swings, and then that builds into your confidence. Or it then does it. Right. You're you're feeling like I feel a little bit like I'm I'm not hitting it flush center contact. Um, and then that you know that you know in essence can can hurt your confidence. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, you know, it's like, a, it's something I feel like it's, it's in you from the start. And I, I always felt like I was a great putter. I always felt like I, I had a great short game, but I, I really like, if we were just going to dive into it, I, I was, I was a great putter and I always believed I was a great putter from like a very young age. And if I, you know, I would have bad putting rounds just like anybody else. But I would always believe that, like, oh, I'm going to make the next putt. Or, oh, I'm going to have a great putting day tomorrow. I just, they just didn't go in today. But I would always have that belief, like, that deep-seated, like, belief to my core that I was a great putter. Now, I don't know how that started, but I think it was probably, you know, like, I would get dropped off at the golf course at 2 o'clock, 2, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon after school. And my parents would pick me up at, you know, 7 o'clock when it would get dark or they wouldn't pick me up till eight o'clock and there was like one light shining in and I would putt for hours and hours and hours, even just under the lights. So, you know, I put in a ton of time with it, but I just believed that I was, I was the greatest putter on the, on planet earth. And it didn't matter if I had a terrible putting round, which we do. Um, there's, there's no two ways about it. Um, but I would always believe that I was going to make the next putt or that tomorrow I was going to putt better than anybody else. Now, I didn't necessarily have that with my full swing, maybe because I didn't put the time in, um, maybe because I didn't have the proper instruction. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that I, did, I don't have the same belief with my full swing as I do with my putting. And that's probably where, like, the chicken or the egg is sort of like, well, I got this deep-seated belief that I'm one of the greatest putters on the planet. Even now, I'm like, I, I'll, I'll, I don't practice that much but i will go out there and i will make putts i know that and, and i'll make putts like when it matters um and so yeah there, it, it, it's a hard thing to quantify what what is it that that gives us that internal belief i think it's has a lot to do with with practice has a lot to do with how you talk to yourself but also has a lot to do with like experiences like yeah i make i make putts when they count i make putts for two dollars or i make putts to win a bet against a, a, a friend or just win a putting contest i make putts when it counts and that i think is one of those things where it's like all those sort of three things combined ha uh, played into now me having this really like deep belief in my core that i'm one of the great greatest putters on the planet and it's so rare to have in a sport such different disciplines right because hogan used to say basically the opposite he's like they're basically two different sports right i can i can hit it great but you put put me over a three footer and he's borderline had the shakes by the end of his career <laughs> um so let's talk about 
what you're doing now, kind of a, a guru of sorts to the tour players working around the greens. Now, you're still an incredible player and have been playing events over the past few years still. What is that transition like and how, and how do you feel different when you show up to an event to play versus show up in a, to an event to work with other players? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I, I definitely, I, I'll wear like different clothes. I'll dress a little bit differently just to, just to like put me in the mindset of like, okay, like I'm here in a coach's role. Like I'll wear different, I'll wear different shades. Like these are, these are my shades for coaching. Right. But I'll yeah. wear more of like a, a Oakley flak jacket when I'm, when I'm going to play, like I'll never wear these if I'm playing in a competitive event. So like different things like that where I'll, you know, I'll sort of like tell my mind like, okay, I'm, I'm in, I'm here in a coaching event, a, a coaching capacity uh, at this event. So, um, but yeah, I think that, you know, my, my, when I started this whole thing, it was, it wasn't to coach tour players. I, I never even had that thought. The thought was really to help, you know, I played so many pro-ams and whatnot, but the thought was really to help the amateur golfer. Um, I call it modernize, modernize their short game. So, you know, be, you know, having played golf for the last, you know, 30, 35 years, um, there's been a lot of modernization and a lot of changes in, in the short game, in, in how it's played and how it's taught. Um, golf courses are made, are, are, are manicured differently. The golf ball is much different than it was, 20, 30 years ago. The wedges, the grooves are much different. Bounces, the sole of the wedges are much different. Um, the way that, that players approach bunker shots is completely different now than it was 30 yeah. years. But yet the same stuff that I was reading in magazines, it was the same stuff was being taught over and over. Um, and it was like there was just not that much thought that was being given to the short game. And um, you know, I, I was sort of coming into like transitioning into coaching sort of about the same time that Bryson was sort of starting to do his stuff with like chasing distance and speed and changing his Working body. Up. And there was a huge push on like, how do we get more distance? And then I was sort of on the back end of that where I, where I was starting to, to get some traction with my stuff was like, well, if, if everyone's hitting it farther, we're going to have shorter clubs into the green. So if you're hitting, if, if you weren't used to reaching par fives and two, now all of a sudden you're getting 20, 30 yards from the green. Now you're in my world and I want to help you modernize your short game so that you're not hitting two great shots to get 30 yards from the green and then taking five shots to get in the hole. So that's where I was sort of like, all right, Bryson's, you know, chicks dig the long ball, right? And Bryson was bringing a ton of great awareness and attention to that. And I was like, well, I want to make the short game sexy too. So that was sort of the, you know, it, it, I played off of what it was that, that Bryson was doing. And, and I was like, well, if everyone's now hitting it further, but you got 330 yard par fours and people are now hitting 50, 50 yards from the green. Cool. I can, I can help you with that shot. So what does that, and just in a little bit more detail, and we can talk about what you're doing with Titleist too. Um, what does that modernizing the short game specifically look like? And I would also just like to add, you know, between guys like you and, and Joseph Mayo, I can finally get my clients to work on their short game a little bit when it used to be like trying to pull teeth. So thank you for that. 100%. Yeah. So I think that, um, yeah, you know, when you, when you look at sort of golf instruction and like how to chip, right? It, it, it's been the same thing for the last like 40 years. It's like, get your weight forward, mm -hmm. uh, put the ball position back and, and try to hit ball first. Um, and that, and that, that's your best way of, of chipping a golf ball. And I was like, yeah, but that's like, there's so many people that freak out because they ha they'll have some bad turf interaction to get the leading edge in there. They'll have bad turf interaction and then they freak out the next time they get a wedge in their hand. Uh, or they'll freak out from the top of their swing because they feel like, oh gosh, I'm going to stick this thing in the ground. Yeah. So I was like, I, don't, I mean, there, there, there's other ways of doing it because I would look at tour players and be like, 
well, his weight's not way forward. His shaft is not leaning way forward, and he's definitely not hitting the ball first. Mm -hmm. Like, what is what is different here? And and so, anyhow, I I was I was super fortunate to have Paul Easinger take me under his wing. Uh, I was, you know, I, I had sort of lost my game in like 2010, and I uh, was just sort of trying to find my golf swing, my golf game in general, just trying to find myself. Um, and Paul Easy was like, look, before you give up the game, like come hang out with me, come spend some time. And so I did, I went back and, and, and hung out with him at, at his house for probably like seven years. I'd go back there a couple times a year and, and we would we would hang and we would talk about life and we'd talk about the Ryder Cup, we'd talk about golf, we'd talk about the mental side of it, we'd talk about shaping shots, we'd talk about um, just everything but but short game was was part of that sort of bigger discussion where we would sit around a chipping green after playing 18 holes or 27 holes we'd sit around a chipping green and i would just watch him and i would ask questions and uh i'd watch him in the bunker and, and ask questions there and it was like man this guy's saying stuff that i've never heard spoken of in sort of the golf instruction world yeah why, why is nobody talking about this stuff um, and he, you know, he was, he was talking about using the bounce. He was talking about, you know, he called it scratching the grass before the golf ball. And it was mm -hmm. like, man, I, I have, I've been to, I've been to every instructor, right? And none of them had talked about that. Um, and so, so anyway, it, it, to me, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And I'd always had a great short game, but then I was like, well, this is a whole new shot that I can, that I can add to my my repertoire and so i started practicing with it i'm like wow this thing comes out like floaty spinny and it feels easier to do like i can miss hit it it's like well this is way easier than me trying to like chop down hit ball first and like yeah. hope that it grabs with a bunch of spin this thing was sort of combining a good landing angle with a bunch of spin it was like well this ball is reacting much faster than my other one that was coming in like this that had a bunch of spin too. And on tour greens, and, and if you're short-sided, it's like, you gotta have a mix in a little bit of land angle with a little bit of a spin to be able to get that ball to stop. So I was like, wow, this is this is really neat and, 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 and fun. And that's sort of like, you know, where, as I, as I then started transition, you know, I had, I had a, a decent year playing golf in, uh, in tournament golf in like 2018 where I got into a handful of events and I had a couple of top 25s and it was like man I'm, I'm playing I'm playing all right I you know I, I'm the stuff that I was working on with Paul was like really coming to fruition and then um and then also I kind of lost it for a few events in 2019 and then as I missed some cuts my status kind of went down and I stopped getting into as many events and then it was like I missed a bunch of cuts by like one or two shots and then all of a sudden I've sort of I'd fallen out of uh, being able to get into tournaments and I'm like, I gotta find something else to do to provide for my family. And so uh, that's sort of when Short Game Chef was, was sort of born. The game of golf. It's both challenging and rewarding, requiring focus, concentration, and the ability to tune out outside distractions. Peak performance is achieved through a synergy of body and mind. Shell Golf Apparel is designed with advanced textile technology that moves with you, with four-way stretch and moisture-wicking properties that keep you cool and dry. Visit shell.shop today and get 40% off the entire golf collection using promo code PLAYERPURSUITS. Now, back to the podcast with your host, Alex Shatek. You know, and that's amazing that you got the opportunity to do that because as a tour player, there's still so much you can learn from other guys. I mean, I, after college, I got the chance to train on, you know, with a contemporary of yours, probably Nick O'Hearn for a little while. And he was teaching me shots that I had never, like you explained, seen, you know, in Golf Digest or heard from an instructor and having access to that is, is so valuable, especially on, I'm sure these tour courses, greens are firmer, they're faster greens than, you know, the before modern day as what, we can easily. 
percent. I had I had at least four four tour players this week ask me how to hit the mid to high flight edge mm-hmm. spinner because obviously before the rings today uh, and yesterday, but like on Monday and Tuesday, I had four players asking me like, "Hey, what are the keys? I want to hit. I got to land this thing steeper. I can't hit yeah. the low. I can't hit the low one um, because the the greens are too firm." And this ball was like huge bounces. And so tour players, you know, it's like they, they're trying to find the right combination so that they can, you know, be aggressive with their approach shots. And then a lot of these courses, I, I think you look back at Pinehurst, um, I think it was like the Michael Campbell Pinehurst when they started shaving, shaving everything off. And then all of a sudden it became in vogue for courses all over the place to now start having these shaved areas just off the green. So that it falls into a low. Now all of a sudden it's wet down there. Plus it's cut tight, and you got to go up four or five feet to a, a pin that's four four paces on. If you're trying to hit a low spinner to that, you're gonna have 12 feet coming back, even if you hit a perfect shot. So it's like guys have to hit the slightly higher trajectory one while maintaining spin. It's not a flop shot, but it's a higher one that still maintains that spin. So when we start talking about um, you know, philosophies in the short game and things like that. Do you have a set of numbers that you look at or are you more so working based on how, what you're seeing the ball do and how the ball react? Yeah, not, I'm not a super numbers guy. Like that's not, not really ever been my thing. It's like I can hear it. I can hear the bounce. I can hear the, the heavier contact with the golf ball. Um, I can see it. I can see what it's doing as it's taking off. And I can Mm -hmm. see the ball on the green, right? It's sort of like you can see the ball flight, you can see the spin, and you can see how it reacts on the green. And, you know, it's, it's, you you use the numbers maybe to sort of measure it after the fact, but, um, but it's, you can, you can see it immediately if somebody's, if somebody's doing it properly or if, if they're not. And when you're working with players, obviously you're working with players across the spectrum. You mentioned, you know, players that you'd seen in pro-ams and obviously tour players now. What are you first looking to do with maybe different level of players? Well, for, first question is always like, what is it that you want to work on? Mm-hmm. Right? Like that's always the first question um, because it's, you know, they're paying me, you know, very well for my time, for my expertise. I'm not going to just be like, Hey, let's run through all the all the the whole gamut. I'm gonna say, what is it that you want to work on? Um, because if they just want to spend two hours in the bunker, let's go. Or if they just want to spend two hours like understanding how to hit a pitch shot, that's fine. We don't need to go and touch on all the other stuff. It's it's always suited to whatever it is that that player wants to wants to work on. And so that's that's really where it starts. Um, and then from there, we just you know, you just sort of see like where, where it takes you, you know, um, you see sort of like, I think that the interesting thing about what I'm doing now is that it's, it's really about me sort of putting, you know, mentally putting the puzzle pieces together as to how to help this person, this player, whether it's a 15 handicap or a guy ranked 20th in the world. It's like, how, how am I going to put the pieces of the puzzle together to give this player like the least amount of, of friction, friction meaning like difficulty to to uh, to adapt and, and to and to like take this on. How am I going to give them the, the least amount of of, uh, of friction to uh, to then basically take take it from where they were to now where they're going to be and, and and improve. So it, yeah. it's always like putting those puzzle pieces together, and that's sort of the the fun part. It's like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like like I worked with um, Tom Kim this past week in in Phoenix, and or this current week, and you know it's like I had looked up some of his stuff beforehand, but you know I'd never really seen his chipping motion that much, and so you know I asked him, well, what is it that you want to work on? And he's like, well, I can hit that low spinner to till the till the day is till the day is uh, light, right? I'm like, okay, cool. He's like, I need to hit that mid trajectory and high trajectory spinner. I can't hit it. Yeah. I was like, okay, perfect. That's where we're starting. And so as we kind of went through and progressed, like I'm, 
I'm trying to put his puzzle pieces together in my head as to like, okay, where are we going to start? How are we going to then make this progression? Um, how do we make it so it's not super difficult? Because he's got to play golf this week. He's trying to compete. He's trying to he's trying to win this golf tournament. How do I make it so this thing doesn't feel so foreign to him, and that this thing feels like it's it can it can, it can become part of him as quick as possible, right? It's always hard to change patterns and all that stuff, but it, how do I make this the most easy transition possible? Yeah, and I like exactly how you talked through that. With my players, I like to talk about like the path of least resistance. Like, how is this going to be most easily implemented so that we aren't taking steps back before we walk forward? I've always kind of believed we don't have to do that if if we put together a good plan in place. I also had the chance to you know listen to you during the open forum at the PGA show, and I loved what you said about working with the player. These these aren't robots we're working with. We're working with a human being trying to make this stuff digestible so that they can play better golf quickly. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk about certain numbers we want to see and certain shots we need to have. And the issue that I've sort of run across with that is that it very much puts a player into a box. You know, if we're going to launch it at a specific trajectory, hit it X distance, but players need to have more shots in their arsenal sometimes and be able to play shots that aren't just trying to find a number. We need to be able to make it functional on the golf course. So I loved the way that you talked through that. Maybe could you give the listener a little bit more about um, what you see on tour and the shots these guys have to play these days? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I think that the overall thing at, like the, at the open forum was that, you know, sort of like, you know, Joe's on the sort of side of like, you know, Hey, don't be afraid of Steve. Now he 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 delivers that that message to where it's like Steve, you know, the, the way that it's interpreted by most people is that Steve is where you have to where you have to live. And if you're not living in Steve, then your math is wrong. Uh, that's not necessarily what Joe means, but that's how it comes across to myself and to a lot of people that have come to me and they're like, "Well, Joe says it has to be this way." Uh, I, I'm, I'm more on the shallower side. I think that, that you know, if you go and look at, at most of the great pitchers of the golf ball and guys that have, you know, really consistent short games, um, you look at like a Steve Stricker, a mm -hmm. Jason Day, a Matt Kuchar, all these guys, and I've talked to them, they, they are never, ever trying to get steep with a standard pitch shot off of a tight fairway lot. Um, you know, I've played a hundred rounds of golf with Cooch, and he's just like, I am always trying to just get this thing to glide. I'm always trying to get it to glide. Um, and Stricker and, and Jason Day, very, very similar. Now, you look at somebody that would, let's say, um, be more considered to be on the steeper side, like a Phil Mickelson. Mm -hmm. And you go and look at his statistical numbers over the last, like, 15 years. Even though in our head we think, you know, Phil is – like got an unbelievable short game his numbers are actually like kind of all over the place when it comes to like strokes gained around the green like one year he's 20th and then the next year he's 70th um and then and it's kind of like it sort of fluctuates in between there where it's like well you think that like you know what first comes to mind is like oh yeah phil's got to be like top five or top 10 every year and it's like he's not really that close to top five or top 10 every year um, sort of kind of far from it um, but you look at Steve Stricker and I went back and I looked at his numbers and it's like it's mind blowing if you go and look up his last 15 years it's mind blowing he's gaining even on the years where he didn't have enough um, rounds played to count for like the, the total ranking even in those years he's still gaining half a stroke per day against the best players in the world half of a stroke per day it's an insane uh, on average, right? And it, and 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 so I think like usually leading is is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6 strokes per day in strokes gained around the green. It's like, I mean, this guy, this guy, like, it's world class. And so, like, why why would we not look at that at what he's doing and try to 
extrapolate what it is he's doing and try to copy that. Um, and Jason Day is very similar too. Like his stats are, are really good. Kucher the same. Kucher the last two years, he led led the tour in strokes gain uh, in 2022 around the green. And I think he was like seventh or eighth last year around the green. So uh, it's, I just, I, I want to copy what, what's the most consistent and, and what gets our gets us the best result. Now, I also think that it happens to be the most repeatable, especially for the amateur golfer. I think it's I think it's super efficient and effective. Stricker, Day, Kucher have all shown that at the highest level. But I also think that this way of doing it, it translates really well to the amateur golfer. Because the amateur golfer doesn't have to rely on just their hands timing it up perfectly. And yeah the steeper you build that that angle of attack the more you've got to you've got to release it and that rate of change happens quite quickly and you better be very good at that um not to say that you can't do it but it takes a lot of practice and it takes it takes a lot of uh skill and timing to pull that off whereas just to build off what you said i've never watched steve stricker and thought that looks complex i watch steve stricker and i say that looks simple and that's always meant as the highest level of compliment in, in any aspect of anyone's golf game. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think true mastery is, is when you make it look simple. And, you know, I was, I was on the range with Sean Foley yesterday, and he said, look, he said, if you, he's like, I showed my mom, who's got the shakes with her hand, <laughs> at, at 80 years old, I showed my mom a bunch of these videos of Steve Stricker, and then I said, this is how you should chip the ball, mom. She goes out into the backyard, and all of a sudden she's got it, and she's chipping it like a tour player. And he's like, "That's the, that's that's where it's like, it can have the quickest impact on the amateur golfer because uh, you're using bigger muscles. You're not relying as much on on the smaller muscles and on timing. Um, but on on top of that, it builds in the biggest margin of error, and it gives it gives that amateur player." Um, the ability to have a, an awareness of like an enjoyable interaction with the turf mm-hmm. versus having a fear of turf interaction. And so that that's where I feel like if I can get an amateur, if this is the turf, I can get an amateur to feel like it's, it's gliding on the turf and they can start having good turf interaction versus if you come up and down like this, well, your way of offsetting it is now you got to open the face like this so that you can come up and down and still hit the back edge of the club. Uh, most amateurs freak out when they see that club face sitting that far open. Um, but I, I just I want to get get players back to like amateur players especially back to enjoying the turf interaction and not being afraid of it. I think that's well, and let's give them a larger margin of error where maybe if they catch it a smidge thin, it, it spins. And if they catch it a smidge uh, hair on the fat side, it, it's going to roll out. And, and all things equal, we end up with a somewhat similar result. Yeah, and I think that, that, that you know, Joe and, and, and the, the, the track man um, guy that was there, Frederick, like they finally had sort of admitted that, you know, Margin of error with, with the with the wide with the wide radius is about this big. Mm-hmm. Margin of error the way that you're going ten or fifteen degrees attack angle down is about this big. Yeah. So in my mind I'm like, well that sure makes sense to me. <laughs> right? What are you gaining by going ten to fifteen degrees down? Maybe five hundred RPMs of spin? Maybe. Mm-hmm. But I, I would argue I look at I watch Kucher and I'm like, this dude spins the living daylights out of it. And he's and he's shallow, um, and he sort of hits. He checks all those boxes that that they want, right? Sub thirty launch, fifty five hundred RPM, um, and yet he's doing it from an attack angle of five down and not fifteen down. So it's like, well, if you can do it with that wider margin of error, and he can still produce a bunch of spin, it, it may it, it's a no brainer in my book. Shell Golf Apparel is designed with advanced textile technology that moves with you, with four-way stretch and moisture-wicking properties that keep you cool and dry. Visit shell.shop today and get 40% off the entire golf collection using promo code PLAYERPURSUITS. Now, back to the podcast with your host, Alex Shattuck. 
Well, let's talk about, the, from a spin perspective, we can also start talking about equipment. And I'd love to hear, obviously, you're doing some great work with Titleist. Maybe start by talking about the flight lines. Yeah, so this was like a COVID idea, right? <laughs> I, I, I just sort of started teaching. Kevin Streelman was my first, like, real client in, like, August of 2019 August September of 2019 was he was like my first real client so I started working with him and then he had started to tell a few of his friends that he played golf with amateur golfers and they started calling me so I started helping them and I was like I was like whoa I was like but once I started looking at it like more out of the lens of like a coach like how am I going to figure out this puzzle piece and I started looking at them and I started I was like like Kevin is really consistent with his setup for like a bump and run, a pitch shot, and then like a high flop shot. And I look at the I, I looked at some of these amateur golfers that I was helping. And I was like, "Whoa, these guys are all over the map. Some are leaning oh, the shaft boy. way forward, some are leaning the shaft way back, some were like club face closed in, some like would never open the club face for a bunker shot or a flop shot." And it was like, "Boy, if I can just put them in the right setup spot with like shaft positioning and club face positioning." If I could give them like a visual key, man, I'm like 80% of the way there to helping. Well, if your setup doesn't match your intention, all of a sudden you got to do all sorts of weird things and compensations and manipulations of the club just to try to do what you think you're trying to do when you lost before you had even started. One million percent. And especially on like a chip shot, right, where the swing is not very long, you don't have time to make all those compensations. So, yeah, I just, I, I, I had this idea and I just, I told my wife, I was like, hey, will you just like sit down grab a sharpie and a ruler and like just mark up the hosel for me like I i'm going to show you like where i want to be for each shot let's just put it on the hosel and see if this is like worth anything um and so i did and i was like it, i looked down at it i was like oh wow this is cool like i think this you got to kind of get over the fact that there's like lines on the hosel because Mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of amateur golfers, the hosel is sort of like, like, don't even say the word hosel. Um, <laughs> because it, you, you know, but, but at the end of the day, if you can use it to kind of help you with your setup conditions, boy, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I know, boom, I'm in the right spot with shaft position and club face position. This shot become, just became a lot easier. And so that's sort of where it started. And then I, I pitched it to Bob Boki and the team over there in probably like June of 2020 like you know we're at tpi and we got to go through all these protocols with like covid and all this stuff and you know, i'm out there i'm out there showing these three lines and you know i asked i asked i asked Voke, i was like hey i was like where do, where do you normally like your players for like a bunker shot he's like well i like that club face open probably like you know about a 45 degree angle almost 30 to 45 mm -hmm. degree angle, depending on the shot and i like the shaft neutral i was like Yep, perfect. I got a line right there. Comes right up to your nose. And I was like, what about a pitch shot? He's like, I would love the shaft to be like in a fairly neutral spot. I was like, cool. Me too. What about the club face? Yeah, fairly square. Maybe just like a degree. I was like, perfect. I got a line right there too. And I was like, what about for a bump and run? He's like, I've actually measured shaft lean on a bump and run for tour players. I was like, no way. He's like, yeah, most tour players are between five and seven degrees of shaft lean forward for a bump and run. I was like, I've got a... I've got a line right there at five degrees forward. And he's like, I think this is a great device. So I was like, oh. so that was sort of like how we, it all sort of got started. And, um, and now, yeah, now with the SM 10s coming out, um, you know, it's just going to be, it's going to be neat to see the evolution of, of flight lines. I, there was a, there's a player this week in the field, Callum Terran, who's using two, two wedges that are um that have flight lines on them and i i was I, I saw him last week and i said i said calum i said i saw that you're you're putting the flight lines wedges into play and he said yeah he's like it's a it's a no-brainer i don't know why i don't know why we wouldn't use these and i was like i agree i but you know and he said <laughs> he's like his coach back in the uk loved them and 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 used them and taught with them as well so um yeah, it was just sort of one of those COVID ideas where I was just like, man, I just, I want to get my amateur golfers to look at set up like my tour players. And that was really the thought behind it, to, to be able to hit the low, the medium, or the high trajectory shot. 
So is there any, got anything else coming down the pipeline? Because that one seemed almost too easy. <laughs> Man, if you if you only knew, that was not. <laughs> it seems easy from the outside, but like patents and getting the challenged. Yeah. Thing it, it was. Not oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's all sorts of uh, yeah. people claiming that they did something similar first, and yeah. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a chipping training aid that I hope will be out. Uh, by the summer it's just sort of like fine tuning the details of it um, and then my focus will go to the bunker I feel like okay. I feel like that's that's an area where if I can find the right sort of training training aid for the bunker um, it will help uh, so many amateur golfers because I think amateurs just really get scared in the bunker because they don't really understand that it's such a different swing than the rest mm-hmm. of the course so um, yeah, so look for a chipping aid out, kind of summertime, hopefully, and then bunker. I just gotta, I gotta, I gotta go on like a like a retreat and just kind of get my mind <laughs> in a spot where I'm in a good creative spot to like come up with something for the bunker because I know I know it's there and I know what all the good players look like. Mm-hmm. I did a video of Matt Kuchar this morning, face on and down the line in the bunker, and it's just like, well, yeah, like. They just everybody needs to look like that. Like it's so good. And 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 I looked at his stats last year. He led the PGA Tour at 68 percent up and down percentage out of the bunker. And uh, the next closest was like 63 or 64 percent. Like he led by a wide margin. But you look at his motion and it's like, yeah, it just looks very simple. But it's like, how do you? How do I how do I get people in the right setup spot? How do I get the right risk conditions? All that kind of stuff is like I'm playing that in my head. It's like how can I how can I find something that would get people to swing it like Matt Kuchar from the bunker? Yeah, it's it's funny how you see amateurs oftentimes petrified of that shot. First of all, they've almost given up hope of of finding anything, but they didn't have the right information to understand what they were trying to accomplish and get out of their swing in the shot before they gave up. So if we can get guys to to understand what we want to see them doing, what the best players in the world are doing, it feels radically different, but as long as they go into it with some trust about trying to implement some of that, they oftentimes see results pretty quickly. Totally. Yeah. All it's, right. It's just getting them the right information and, and right. Uh, getting them the right feels. Uh, but it's again, it's so different that it does it does feel a bit foreign, and and that part of it uh, can be frightening for, you know, for someone who's a weekend warrior or maybe who plays once a month because they got kids or work or whatever. It, it's it, it's a bit it, it's, you know, it, it's 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 a different feel and it takes a, it takes a minute to kind of get it, you know. One hundred percent. The game of golf. It's both challenging and rewarding, requiring focus, concentration, and the ability to tune out outside distractions. Peak performance is achieved through a synergy of body and mind. Shell Golf Apparel is designed with advanced textile technology that moves with you, with four-way stretch and moisture-wicking properties that keep you cool and dry. Visit shell.shop today and get 40% off the entire golf collection using promo code PLAYERPURSUITS. Now, back to the podcast with your host, Alex Shattuck. Thank you so much for your time, Parker. You've been, you've been so oh generous God. with it. Where can listeners find you physically or, or see you online? Like, what's your pitch? What, what can you plug? Uh, yeah, so I would say that, you know, the, the best... I put out, I, I, I was really thoughtful about how I wanted to get my message across to the world um, because if I was just doing it one person at a time, mm-hmm. I can only see one person at a time and there's only so many hours in the day. So uh, so I built a website, shortgamechef.com, and on the website, I break it down into really digestible videos. So for instance, we have a, we have a, 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 a a chapter on there called Cure the Yips. So in Cure the Yips, I've got like 35 videos where I break it down. Like, here we go. Like, let's. This is probably why you've got the yips, and here's how we're going to help you get out of it. And each each video, kind of in that one and a half to three and a half minute range, 
So they're really short and digestible. And so you can you can watch them, you can take a couple notes, you can move on to the next video. Um, but I give you the reasons why you're, you've probably got the yips and then how to get out of them. And we've, we've had we've had already probably 20 plus people that have been a part of this uh, membership website that have cured their own yips without me actually even putting my hands on them. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible what, what these videos have done, because again, it sort of goes against what's been taught for the last 30 or 40 years. And once I give people this information, they're like, Oh my gosh, no wonder I was choking it for the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so short game, short game com is sort of where I, I, I decided to put all my best information bunkers chipping pitching uh putting like we haven't really even talked about putting but um that was probably one of the one of the best things that i did was well we talked a bit about it but that was probably one of the best things that i did was was i was a great putter and i knew why i was a great putter and so i dive deeper into that on the website and yeah and then there's some really neat like i call them secret recipes so I have guys like Keith Mitchell, Matt Kuchar, Lee Trevino, Ben Crenshaw, Brad Faxon. Uh, I have all these people on there uh, talking about why they're good at certain things. So why is Ben Crenshaw one of the greatest putters? Same with Brad Faxon. And these guys like go into detail and give us give us a, a sneak peek as to why they're great putters. Kuchar does an unbelievable job talking about how to hit this like spinning mid-flighted trajectory pitch shot same thing with keith mitchell um and so it's, it's really neat to hear it from the perspective of the player and them giving up a little bit of their sort of secret sauce and it, it's 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 a i'm trying to just build this thing little by little and just add more videos so when we started there was you know 110 videos on there uh with maybe six different chapters uh, of the different facets of short game and now we've got over 200 and I think 80 videos where it's just there's so many things on there that you can really dive deep and learn uh, whatever it is that you want to learn whether it's a bump and run or a flop shot or how to get out of a, a, a plug bunker lie you can you can learn all this stuff um, and, it, and it's really easily digestible I think some of the stuff like on YouTube these videos are like 20 minutes long and I know like for myself I get through like 10 minutes of the video. I'm like, oh man, I forget what he said in like, in like two video, like minute two and a half. And so like, I really chunked them up small bite size to be able to just make it easily digestible so that you can watch the video. Okay, I got that section that Parker was talking about. Let me write a couple notes and now I can move on. Versus well, like- Well, I see that problem from video work, but then the other problem I see from YouTube or Instagram or whatever it may be, is the player might like that video, but maybe not comprehend all of it, and they scroll, and the very next thing, or the next button they click, is a completely different philosophy, and now it's these counteracting ideas, and now they're more lost than they were before they started. So, step number one, I'm about to do another podcast on improvement and implementation of, of swing changes, but step number one is pick a philosophy and stick to it. <laughs> Totally agree, and I think that you know it, 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 it's 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 okay to explore these different these different philosophies and see what works what works well for you. I think that the steep the steeper chip shots and pitch shots worked well for Victor because of his wrist conditions and because 100%. of the amount of right side bend that he had. And so you know that's not necessarily every golfer like Victor Hovland. <laughs> is an absolute freak when it comes to swinging a golf club. And, and he's, he's an absolute, um, like, crazy good talent when it comes to, like, really striking the golf ball. Mm -hmm. um, now, does everybody have the same patterns that Victor has in their full swing? Absolutely not. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody swing it necessarily like Victor Hobbit. No. So if he's got his matchups and then – those matchups worked really well with the steep angle of attack. It doesn't necessarily mean that that steep angle of attack is now going to work well for the rest of the golfing population. 
Right. I think I've used Victor Hovland as a model for a golf swing, maybe with one player who had some similar tendencies across all of them. And I, I actually had the chance to kind of pick Joe's brain at the U.S. Open during a practice round with Victor. I was with a player that was playing with him. And, yeah, everything that is on, you know, that side of the spectrum makes complete sense. Um, you know, you got to pick with pick what you want to go with, what you think is easiest to implement, and what allows you to keep the widest variety of shots with the largest margin of error for you. Yeah. And maybe that's a little different for every player. And I'm always, you know... I'm always a, a fan of like, I want to build you a foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to build you that foundation. Now, that foundation is not going to be is not going to be 12 to 15 degrees down. It's just not where the foundation is, right? The foundation is going to be living more around five, well, maybe even like three to eight degrees down. Is sort of like where that foundation will live. Now, off of that foundation, there's going to be a variety of shots that you're going to need to hit. That shot will be one of them, right? Mm -hmm. But I also think you can hit that low shot without being 15 degrees down. I think you can hit that low shot, and Cooch has proved it, and a lot of my guys prove it too. With, with them being three, four, five, six down, they can hit that lower trajectory spinner. But I always argue, I'm like, the, the when are you going to actually hit that low spinning shot? When? Are you going to hit it to a front pin? Nope. Because nope. you're going to need a little bit, of, a little more angle of descent. Are you going to hit it to like a tucked back right pin or back left pin if you're short of the green? Probably not because you're going to need to get it up and over that sort of edge. Are you going to hit this shot to a back pin? Yeah, potentially. But why would you need all that spin if you've got a whole runway back to the back pin? So I don't exactly. necessarily see a, like... There's not a huge need for that shot. I think it's a great shot to have in your repertoire. But, a lot, I mean, so many of these tour players that I see, like, this this whole week, they're like, I don't know when you would hit that shot. I don't know why when you would find yourself needing to hit that shot. It's a really cool shot. It's fun. It's a, it's a, it's a great, um, uh, you, you could call it like a, a parlor trick shot, right? Where it's like... Crowd pleaser. You know, if you're... <laughs> If you're on a pool table and you're hitting like a super spinny one, like it's really cool to see. But if you're going for repeatability and in, in something that you you know you want to be able to control the spin, you're not looking for necessarily max spin in those situations. You want to just know like, okay, this ball is going to bounce, bounce, check, and then trickle out. Mm -hmm. I, I read I read something that this uh, Dr. Luke Benoit posted that. Um, after 2011, once they changed the wedge grip, right? It, the USGA thought that because guys were spinning it less, that scoring would actually go up. And the, and, and the converse thing happened. The less spin that guys had, they actually understood how to manage that spin. And they actually got the ball closer to the hole. Scoring went down. But there's a little less spin. It's not quite as variable to them on miss hits. Yep. Yep, exactly right. So I just think, you know, max friction, I, I just don't think that tour players are are really looking for max friction um, hardly at all during a round of golf. In a tournament round of golf, very rarely are they looking for max friction. They're just looking to control that spin, but max friction just brings in um, potential, for, potential for big disaster, right? You're always... You know, no tour players. You know, they're 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 sneaky. They're trying to play the odds, right? They're smart. They they know that if you're trying to hit a max friction shot, you're bringing in a lot of bad stuff that could happen. So they're always trying to play the odds a little bit and say, "All right, I'm going to put a little bit of spin on this, but I also know that if I miss hit it, I'm still going to end up inside that four foot circle." And that's sort mm -hmm. of where where I come into play with, with, with my sort of philosophy. Which again is not necessarily like my only philosophy, but I'm just learning it. I'm watching these tour players and being like, "Well, he's one of the best in the world, and he does it. He's one of the best in the world, and he does it." He's, and I just keep going down the line, and I'm like, "Well, they're all kind of like doing it, and they're all the best in the world at it." That's where I'm like, <coughs> "Excuse me." That's that's where I'm like, "Boy, this is this is something that we should be copying, 
uh, because the best in the world and the guys that their their paycheck relies on on them executing these shots. Let's let's pay attention to what they're doing. Well, you also lived it with the decision making in the sense of shot selection, right? I, I try to tell my players that whether it's courts management or shots around the green, it's like being at the blackjack table. You're going to make the as aggressive as a play as you can that still makes mathematical sense. 100%. And so when you say that, think about the freedom that you will get standing over a 20, 30-yard pitch shot and knowing that you can hit, you can make a mistake an inch behind the golf ball because you're on the shallower side, because you can let the bounce engage. And that bounce is going to keep you up above the ground. It's kind of surfing on the top of the of the ground. And now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can miss hit this by an inch behind it and still hit a great shot. Now all of a sudden you're way more free than if you're like, well, I, I need to hit 15 degrees down on this thing, back of the ball perfectly, because I want to hit a max friction, super spinner, low spinner. Like, to me, uh, you got to be you got to be really precise and really perfect with that kind of a shot. Um, so I just think that that it's it's a, it's a more uh, the, the odds are more in your favor, and it actually frees you up a little bit once you understand. All right, I can hit an inch behind it and still hit a great shot. Like I, I watched Mitchell yesterday hit a hundred a hundred pitch shots, and it, and he probably hit I don't know. 30% of them, he, he drop kicked them. They all, they're all still going up like this far away and they're all still spinning a bunch, right? And and so it's like, you know, you, it, it, like golf is so hard. You want to be able to stack the odds in your favor. You really do. Um, you don't want to make golf harder than it needs to be. And so I just feel like amateur or pro, both, both, both sets are trying to make golf easier golf is so difficult why not why not build some margin of error in your favor whereas you know it's like the same thing with like putting it on a tee it's like well you put it on a tee because you want you want a little more margin of error. every time what it's yeah, exactly right so uh, it's way it's way harder to hit driver off the deck um than it is to hit driver off of a tee so i, I i'll hit driver off the deck but i'll like put it up on a tuft to grass because I know like it takes left out of play for me. Mm-hmm. So if I know like if I can put it on a tough to grass, driver off the deck takes left out of play for me. So OB left, I'm taking that. I'm not necessarily being like, well, let me tee this thing up four inches and full send, right? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna full send it if I'm like, oh yeah, OB left. I gotta get this in the fairway. I'm gonna throw it on the deck and be like, I'm gonna sacrifice some yardage here, just like you would sacrifice maybe 500 RPMs a spin uh, if you're going for max friction versus not max friction. But you know that your um, your miss hit, my miss hit is way more manageable, like driver off the deck, I know that it's not gonna go left. Like it's just sitting a little bit up, I know it's not going left. So my miss is manageable with driver off the deck. If I put it on a tee, let's say four inches up, in my head I'm like, okay, this is full send. That also kind of brings in a little bit more of this, left and right. Yeah, your dispersion is going to go up a little bit for some extra yardage. It's about picking and choosing your battles. Totally. And and I'll go back and forth all the time between like, all right, par five, feeling really good, teeing it up like this. Up, par five, tight, tight fairway, I'm going to either go like super low tee or, or driver off the deck. It just sort of like... it. It, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, you, you just sort of, you, you try to play the odds and stack the odds in your favor. Same, same thing if like you're in between clubs, right? If you've got seven or eight iron and it's like, well, I got to chip a seven or I got to smash an eight. Now, well, you got to kind of play the odds in your, in your head of like, am I better at smashing the eight or am I a better, do I swing the club better at 80% seven iron? And that's you, that's, a, there's no like perfect answer for that. It's usually a player mm-hmm. thing, but you play the odds in your head of like, okay, well, my miss hit when I go with the smooth seven is usually a pull. Pins back left. I can't pull this thing and go in the water left. Let me hit a full out eight iron and aim 10 feet right of it and know that if it draws a little bit, it's fine. But, you know, it, you're always trying to play the odds. I just think that 
when it comes to like hitting a pitch shot off a tight fairway lie. I think that the odds are more in your favor when you're three to eight degrees down and not necessarily 12 to 15 degrees down. Yeah, I make golf easy. Make it easy. Pick, 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 the, pick the shot that's going to give you the least amount of resistance around the golf course. Uh, so for those that are listening, uh, Parker is in his car waiting out the waiting out the weather delay at the waste management. Yep. It's a little bit of a home game for you this week, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was great to be able to see some of the guys and, and, and get out there. And, um, you know, there's so much energy around this Phoenix Open. Uh, <laughs> it's quite the sight to, sight to see. Sad that, I mean, I've, you know, we've been talking for an hour and, and it's, it's only not rained like five minutes out of that hour. It's still, it's still coming down pretty good. So, it's that. The desert sad. isn't always prepared for that either. I know, and and, and next week the, the weather forecast is like seventy degrees, sunny every day. So it's, it's pretty unfortunate. But so, what does the week on on tour look like for you? How many players are currently kind of in the stable? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, you know, I, I would say that, that my um, – I, I try to structure it to where I'm more of a consultant to these guys. I want to check in with them, you know, kind of once a quarter. Um, if it's new in the relationship, it's like let's stay on top of it and kind of get these things worked out. But someone like Keith Mitchell, you know, it's like we usually check in like once a quarter or um, or, or, or twice a year just to make sure that he's in the right spot. Um, but he's, he's, he's got it to a spot where he owns it. He, know, he, he owns it, he knows what he's doing, and he understands his faults and fixes. So he's very autonomous. And that's sort of what I want for my players. I want them to, to own it because if you get to a spot where you're not, you're not owning it and you're on Sunday and you're choking your guts out and you're looking outside the ropes of like, what shot should I be hitting here? Or you, you're you're just not set up for success. So I, I want my players to be able to own it. So I, I try to structure it to, to say, look, I'm not going to be traveling 25 weeks a year. If, if that's something that you want, I'm probably not the right guy for you. Um, but I, I'm, I'm happy to, to, you know, be a consultant and help, help you bounce ideas and, and, and figure all that out. Um, so yeah, you know, it's interesting because there are tour guys that, that do want the every week consistency of like, you know, some type of um, hands-on approach. And there's there's also guys that, that, that want to own it. Um, like Anna Nordquist. I've worked with Anna for three, four years probably. Three and a half, four years. I've never once been to one of her tournaments. Never once. And I've offered. I'm like, yeah. You know, you, you, they, she had a tournament like 20 minutes away from me. I was like, I'm happy to go up and, and, and help you if you want. She's like, if I feel like you're there, I'll be looking around, like asking for answers. She's like, once I'm at a tournament week, I want to be able to own it. And I'm like, wow, that's so profound, right? Like, it, it, like just the awareness that she has in that, even if mm -hmm. she doesn't have it fully like baked in and like, I got it. She wants to feel like she's got it, right? Without like without having to look and be like, hey, coach, give me the answers here, right? So, yeah. the, you know, I, like <clears throat> I, don't, I don't necessarily judge my success by like how many tour players I'm currently working with. Um, I, I, I'm, my, I feel like my mission is to, is to really help get a lot of the messaging from what guys are doing on the PGA Tour to help make golf mm -hmm. a little bit easier for them. Try to get that messaging out to the world. That's where I feel like my, my sort of passion and my calling is. And, and if guys on tour want to, you know, want my eye to, to help, you know, hey, get them out of a rut or teach them a new shot, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to, to help with that, but I'm not in a position to be like, yeah, I'll be your coach 24-7. All right. Thank you so much, Parker. It was great chopping it up with you. You can find him on Instagram, Short Game Chef, shortgamechef.com. 
uh, for all your short game needs. And uh, it was great to have you on. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.